I had a, a frustrating time during my waiting time. There were times when I was peaceful about it, but there was also an element of, I've waited all this time. I'm wasting my time. Why aren't I moving? You know, and I think we often feel like that. Um, just just a, a lovely little nugget of love that the Lord sent me. Sue went into care in autumn of 2019. And it was at that point I knew that I was going to have to move from the big house that we're in, which the Lord had given us. And that was another amazing story that some of you know and had blessed us there. But obviously that was time was over and it was time to move on. So I started thinking about moving, put my house just not quite on the market the agent came, I think, on the Tuesday for me to sign the papers and he said, we won't actually do it yet, Pat, he said, because Boris is making an announcement tomorrow. <laughs> and you know what Boris said, stay home, don't do anything. And that was the ultimate time of waiting for most of us, I think, in recent years, probably. Um, so I just had to be peaceful about that. And then as time went on and we came out of lockdown and I tried again and all sorts of legal things came up that made it really... Very difficult to sell the house while Sue was still around, sadly. Um, it just didn't seem to be working and the legal advice was just, just wait. It's going to take two years to sort this out. It might be a court case. Sue's prognosis was only a year and it, you know, it was a horrible situation. But that's, and I said, Lord, I need to move. I need to get out of this complicated, difficult situation. I need to start my life again. And it didn't happen. And then he gave me this verse that you'll know in Joel. Joel I will restore the years that the locust has eaten. And you'll, you'll know that God sent a famine, the locusts came and eat all the harvest because of their disobedience. And when, they, when the Israelites repented, the harvest came back again. And as human beings, we can't, I don't think, replace time. Almost anything else in our lives, our possessions, our money, to some extent our friends, our family, our connections, our jobs, we can replace in some form, maybe not our families so much, but time we can never get back. And I don't know how God gets it back, I don't think he can, but he can make it up to us. And the promise he gave to me was, I will restore the years that the locust has eaten. So I took that, that this is not wasted time, we've already said, he's going to bless you some way and I thought okay that's fine and then the other day I thought about this again and I looked at the passage and the years of famine were four years it was 2019 when I started this journey and I'm about to move so you do the sums you know isn't that lovely I thought that was just such a blessing for me Jeremiah 29 says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you future, to give you a future and a hope. So the time of waiting, as we've said, often leads to a time of moving on and a time of change. So this is where I just want to lead us into before Pauline takes us on to some prayer. So I'll just finish this bit. Um, I think this principle of timing and moving on and change doesn't just apply to us, as we've already discussed, in our personal lives and our family lives, but to our church life. And we've been talking about how people have been praying for revival in the circuit and in the church for a long time, and I think that's true. When we first came here, we kind of felt that, I don't want to sound critical, but we weren't sure where the church was going. People were praying for things to move on. And I know lots of you have done the same thing and not very much seems to be happening. And then things started to move. We had the, the ministry of uh, the Love Your Neighbour. We had Chatterbox starting to build up again, especially as we came out of COVID. Things started to happen and things within the church kind of felt different somehow. So people were keen to do something and do something differently. And I know that David had a vision for this and he led us very much into this idea of thinking about we need to do things differently. Um, and these initiatives that had already been started, you know, were starting to be a, more of a blessing to people. Um, and we've started changing the practical ways we do that. We've changed the services. We're using the building in different ways. The property committee have been able to help improve the lighting and the heating and the technology so that that's improved things. So I think those kinds of changes will definitely help in our ministry to people outside of the church or make it more accessible, easier for to use a building which could be a problem become a blessing because of the way that we're using that. 
But I think there's not only the ministry to people outside, but there's ministry to each other, to the members of the church. And our current problem, as you know, is that we have a huge shortage of ordained ministers and not enough lay preachers. And that's meaning that we are having to do things differently. Somebody said, oh, we're all doing too much too already. It's not a question of working harder, is it? It's a work, question of working differently. Smarter, they say, in the business world, but you know, maybe more spiritually, more in tune with what the God, God is leading us into. Um, and these times when we have own arrangements because there's a gap in the plan, I don't think we need to see that as a problem. I think that is a huge opportunity because it means that all of us, because every Christian we know has got gifts, gifts, not just one, you know, it's lots of things that we can do. And maybe we haven't all used all the gifts. I saw that. <laughs> we haven't all been brave enough or even seen the opportunity to use the gifts that some of us have got. And this will bounce us into doing that, I think, really. So I'm absolutely certain I won't be the last person standing up here doing this sort of thing because I'm sure some of you have already done it. Lots of people here and in the main congregation are more than capable, even if they don't do a study like this, will be able to share their story. We all have an experience of the Lord. We're all able to share what he's done with us, even if it's not quite like this, but even more informal. We sit in a circle and everybody says, well, this is what God did for me this, this week. It can be so encouraging. I think it's been lovely, the services we've had, where we've heard other people testimony to the way God is working in their life. In the early church, we know they had all things in common, do you remember? And I took that to mean, well, they shared their houses, they shared their food, they babysat for each other, they worked in each other's businesses, you know, they helped each other out financially. Did it also mean that they shared the ministry? I think perhaps it did, because they only had 12 apostles, and we know they appointed deacons for the practical work, but I think they supported each other by praying together, by meeting together, by talking about what was God was doing in their lives. And I would love to see that happen a lot more than it does here. It happens in small groups, I know, but I think it could happen much more widely. And it's a blessing to us to hear other people's stories, but we get blessed as well as we share. And, you know, it's a way of building each other up. So I'm sure I won't be the last person here doing this sort of thing. And to remember that God keeps his promises. He promised Abraham those humongous promises and he kept them. He's promised us lots of things, and we know that he's always kept our promises. I think it was Pauline said, as we look back through our lives, see times of waiting, we see that God has been faithful. He has kept his promises. As we look down through the history of God's people, we see how he's kept his promises. They are still in their land that he promised them. I know they've got problems, but they're still there, aren't they? And they're still a nation, an identifiable, separate nation of God's people. So we have a few... A great future, I think. It might mean tweaking little things. It might be big changes, but I think God is leading us on. And I, you know, I'm sad to be leaving at a time when I'm sure lots of wonderful things are going to be happening here if we can get this waiting time right through now and that we can start to work in a different way and God can bless us. So I'm just going to finish with the last verse. Psalm 24 says, Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation, and for you I wait all day long.